Today, we're going to be talking about Harlequin. Harlequin is a power tool for ordinary users and developers. I've already got Harlequin installed and I'm on my desktop and Harlequin is already in use. Even though it's not open, it's doing stuff. One example of that is this nice little clock that you get on the menu bar. And the other Harlequin feature available outside of Harlequin itself, and to me, it's a fairly major feature, is it adds a custom file selector. So here's our new file selector. It has all the usual features, you know, navigating directories and stuff like that. You can specify wildcards for your file names, but where it comes into its own is things like this. It'll store your most recently used folders, and you can also manually add things to this list. Here I've added a folder where my LaTeX documents live. Now, LaTeX was a subject of my previous video, link up there somewhere. This feature is really handy when you're programming or working on large collections of documents and you have to keep going to the same locations all the time. In the file list, if you double click on a file, it will open it. Now that wasn't the standard gem file selector behavior, believe it or not. But if you shift double click on a file, it'll give you information about it, including its size. You can make it read only, you can rename it. You can also delete it. For folders, I'm going to go back up a level. And if you shift double click on a folder, you get modification dates, sizes, and you can rename it. But it's worth bearing in mind that renaming a folder is only available in TOS, I think it's 104 and above. And there are many other things you can do in this file selector. You can find a file. Let's search for calculate.tech, which was in the analysis subfolder. And there it's found it. You can create folders, see what the disk free space is. You can import selection, which puts your current folder into that path dropdown. You can sort by various criteria and you can change the font. You can also disable the file selector. Now, I'm not sure what would happen if you actually did that. I don't know how you get it back on again, but uh, I presume it's in the configuration somewhere. However, the meat of Harlequin is visible when you open it. Now, it appears in the system dropdown as an accessory. Although the authors of the app were very, very clear in their documentation to say it is not an accessory. Yeah, browsers used to think of this as a super accessory, but sorry, devs. Each of these icons represents a module, and the modules are loaded into memory, executed and unloaded by Harlequin. So it's kind of operating like a little mini operating system. So to show how that works, we can have a look in here. So if I go into my Harlequin folder, then my modules folder, we've got things like alarm, alarm event, ASCII, Calc, and if you look across this window, we see alarm, alarm event, ASCII, and Calc. Now there was an API for third-party modules, and while I've never had a look around the magazine cover discs to see if there were any, I'm pretty sure there will have been. Harlequin is a very, very popular app back in the day. From the point of view of the Harlequin authors, the main focus of Harlequin was the manager, and the manager is a kind of a PDA, and we're going to get to that a little later in this video. But first, let's start with alarms. So you can set an alarm, which is just a one-off trigger, or you can create alarms using the manager, which can then be scheduled in the future. What I'm going to do is set an alarm for 70, 35, and 50 seconds. Very precise, I know. I'll activate the alarm, and then in about 30 seconds time, there'll be an alarm going off. So have a look at the top right of the screen where the clock is, and you'll actually see that it toggles between the alarm time, what, for the next alarm actually, and then the current time. Now, since the alarm time and the current time are quite close together, that might actually look a little confusing, but in normal use, it isn't. I'm going to speed this up until it goes off. Yeah. I find it funny that when you think about the alarms that you get in modern computers and phones, they give you little bright, chirpy musical stabs that make you feel glad to be waking up. Harlequin's alarms sound as miserable as miserable can be. Oh, well done, Harlequin designers. Played a blinder there. Now I'm going to turn the clock off for now. Just for the sake of continuity in this video, as uh, the clock will jump all over the map as I move things around in the editor. Now, I'm just going to open my editor for a moment. And if we open Harlequin from within my editor, we see the advantages of it launching as an accessory. Because you don't have to exit the app you're in to get to Harlequin. We're running under Gemini desktop, so we're single tasking, not multitasking. In this manner, Harlequin offers you multitasking for free, if you like. I'm just going to open a file for a second and we'll have a look at some of the things we can do from within Harlequin. Now, I use my ST primarily to code and write my homework up for university. And I often needed to know uh, key codes when programming menus, etc. And Heineken's ASCII module has you covered for that. And there's also a really nice little calculator, and that's very handy when writing code. It's a reasonably basic calculator. By default, it runs in integer mode. So if you want to do math with digits, 
Well, you can do it in two or four decimal points. So 1.4 times 23.2333, and it gives you the results up to four decimal places. Mostly I'm going to use integers because I was writing in assembly language in C, and we didn't have an FPU on the Atari ST. Now, you can switch between decimal, hex, and binary mode. And while it doesn't have any of the more sort of useful logical operators like AND and OR and exclusive OR, it was certainly more than good enough for me at the time. Now, next one up is one of two apps which are real lifesavers. Disk utility. When you're in an app and you're working away and you need to save a file to a flop, you don't, but you just don't have any formatted disks, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to quit the app and lose all your changes just to format a floppy? Well, no, you can use the disk utility model. We can open this and select our device that we want to format, A or B, and whether we want it single-sided, double-sided or high density. And we can format the disk from 80 to 83 tracks and we can specify whether we want 18 or 20 sectors per track. Now there's options in here to do things like set this, the fat format to small fat. And the developers say this creates a partition table that's optimized for the content and can shrink the fat table to an extent that you can get up to an extra 2K extra space per disk, which was not to be sniffed at. So pressing the format button does exactly what you think. But you can also use this dialog to copy entire floppy disks. You can select the source and the target devices. And interestingly, it offers you the option to copy the entire disk or just to use sectors, which you know would be faster. Next, if you want to manipulate files, which is the other life-saving thing that this thing does, we have the file manager. So let's say I want to back up a couple of my tech files. Let's pick a few. And I'm going to go to the root of my E drive. And now we're going to use the option to create a folder. And I'm going to call this backup. And it's created a folder for me. Now I go into that folder, select copy or move, and it copies the files across. You can also delete files, rename them, all sorts of things. Like I say, a true lifesaver if you don't want to exit your main app. However, let's just do that and exit Everest. And we're going to go into re and just verify it worked. There's our backup folder. All nice and good. Now I'm just going to tidy that up. Okay, back into Harlequin. Now we've looked at the disk utility and the file utility. Font editor is what it seems to be. It can edit fonts. Now, not too interesting for me or useful for that matter because really it's not compatible with NVDI. Key editor is interesting. It allows you to map certain characters onto keys. So for example, if you're editing a document and you don't use backtick, but you do frequently need a copyright symbol, you can map that key to be the copyright symbol and it will work across all apps in the operating system. Now here are two modules that I really don't think I'm gonna be wanting to use. In fact, convert is a third one I'm not gonna use. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hide them. I hide them, I, I change it to layout by file name, and there they are, gone, and the display is nice and tidy. And yes, if you want to, you can unhide modules, either all of them or just one particular one. And as usual, we'll have to save to possess these settings. So the macro module allows you to assign things to keystrokes, like you can open a Harlequin module based off of a keystroke, perform cold and warm reboots, which is very handy, and you can record and play back a series of keystrokes and assign them to a key, which is useful in many cases. Now, Monitor allows you to page through the ST's RAM. You can jump to specific addresses and search for strings. You can do the same thing on files. Uh, let's pull up icdboot.sys. That's a binary file. That's the driver that gets loaded at boot type to bootstrap the hard drive. And finally, we can actually examine the actual hard drive itself. And again, here at the start, you see the ICD magic string in there, which is the actual physical boot sector for ICD, which loads icd.sys. So all very simple. Now the right button allows you to enter update mode and change the bytes in memory on a file or on a disk. I wouldn't touch that functionality with a barge pole. It's far too risky to break everything. But certainly at times when you're developing, the monitor is a very, very, very useful tool. Okay, next, the new editor. There was an old editor in previous versions of Harlequin. This is the new editor. And we'll load up a decent sized file. Now this is very, very snappy. I think you'll see. It's fairly fully featured. It's got copy and paste and all the usual stuff. But this wasn't just a text editor for programming. It's also a mini word processor. For example, you can set headers and footers on pages for printing. So here we're going to print the page number in the footer and in the header, it's going to give you the file name, the date and the time that you printed it. Okay, next, Harlequin comes with a control panel. This performs most of the actions that you might need. For example, muting the dreaded keyboard beep, setting your mouse speed, setting up your keyboards, lots of different things. One downside is, however, that it does not support control panel extensions. 
And so I have to keep X control on the system to allow me to configure NVDI, which is very important to me. Next up, the printer filter that intercepts characters going to the printer and can optionally map them to other characters or strings of characters. Now, as an example of how you might use this, you could map the character character to output a string that sets bold on for your printer and another key to set bold off. The printer module itself tells Harlequin what type of printer you have. It's all fairly standard stuff. And it also allows you to enable a spooler. And what the spooler will do is it will slurp all of the characters being printed by an application into an in-memory buffer. And then that'll allow the application to actually carry on while the printer churns away. Now Harlequin supports RAM disks. We're going to create a RAM disk in a moment, but let's have a quick look at show memory because show memory is showing us that we have about 40 K of memory free in Harlequin. So Harlequin reserves a block of memory at boot time and has features built into it that preserves that across the soft reset of the ST. Now, once you've used all your memory from Harlequin's reserve buffer, if you try to open a new module, you'll get an out of memory warning and then you need to reboot. Now you can increase the total amount of memory available to Harlequin uh, if you have a machine with more RAM, but let's just create a RAM disk. Let's use drive M and let's bring that down to 40 megabytes. Okay, after exiting the module, our drive M is there on the desktop. Very nice. Thank you, Gemini. Gemini is really good at detecting stuff like that. If we get information on our drive, we have, oh, 31K free. So it's not massive. But out of our 40 meg, it's had to use 9K to put the directory structures, you know, the fat table, etc. Now you might be wondering, well, why use a RAM drive? So let's take the example of what I used to do, which is writing programs. So the compiler takes a number of C source files and compiles each one into binary.o files. And then these are then linked by the linker into a .prg file for execution. If you write the .o and .prg files into a RAM disk, instead of a hard disk or even worse, a floppy disk, the compile time is way faster. I mean, when working purely off floppies, it was about a 10x speed increase. Okay, let's have a look at the manager. So the manager is the central feature of Harlequin. In modern terms, it's a mixture of several different apps on your phone, actually. The notes app, the contacts, reminders, alarms, and the calendar app. And as you can see, it's, it's a complex looking beast. And I'll point out straight away, it's kind of Y2K compliant, but it's also kind of not Y2K compliant in a few areas. So unfortunately, it just has a few rough edges these days. I'm just gonna make this window a little bigger. So what do we have in here? I'll mention menu items if we need them as we go. It has a toolbar. These buttons are used to alter the view. So I can show today's tasks, which there aren't any tasks for June, then tasks for 2024. We have two buttons that change the layout of the data on the main area. The current view is the detail view and we can narrow it down to a more task-based view. And here on the toolbar, we have some navigation controls that allow you to step by a day or by a week in your calendar views when we drill down into the data. So looking at the meat of the user interface, we have some controls over here that allow you to filter the information that's on the other side of the UI. So for example, let's say I want to see bugs and pinned items. Now I want to see both, so I make it an all filter, and there we go. Now I'm just going to reset that filter. So everything in the manager centers around the concept of notes. So I'm going to create a new note, which I do by either clicking that button up there or by double clicking on an empty space. And I'm going to call this eat lunch and I'll save that. And there it is in our list. Now we can give this some scheduling information, some priority settings, a key, which is kind of just a categorization of notes and we can mark it as complete. The extra column shows additional information. This says that there's an alarm associated with, with a note. This one has a time range. So dinner is between 8 p.m. and midnight. I mean, come on, Craigie, that's a long dinner. Finally, this red arrow indicates that this is a type of task which has a set date on it. But if that date passes and it's not marked as complete, it'll just move it over to the next day until it gets done. Down here, we have this little checkbox that says complete. So if I want to remove complete items from my view, how do I do that? I could filter by tick and then go to not equals. And now we have a list of all our incomplete tasks. Let's go back to our eat lunch task and we'll see what we can do with it. And what we're going to do is we're going to connect it to a calendar. So I'm going to start with today's date. It's the 7th of July, so that's easy. Entering 7-7, it will pad that out to be the 7th of July current year. And I want to set a repeat, so I'm going to repeat the note every day. Now, when picking the repeat interval, it gives you contextualized dates. So it's offering me every day, every Sunday, the seventh day of every month, the 25th, the last day in the month. I guess that's the last Sunday in the month, the first Sunday in the month and yearly. Now the Harlequin manual has a really long section on specifying dates and durations and freeform text entry allows you to get very, very sophisticated, <laughs> oh, I can't say sophisticated, sophisticated repeats. But here I'm going to go for daily. 
Now, this is where the Y2K stuff starts coming in. Notice that it's put the until as 1999. And I obviously don't want that because it's 2024. So we could change this via this dialog or we can just edit it. I'm going to set it to 2026. Uh, TOS is capable of handling dates into the 2040s, I believe. I click insert to save it. Now it appears in the list and that less than symbol is another indication of slightly wonky Y2K support. Now we can add a time for this. I could say that I want my lunch to be at 1300 and with a duration of one hour. Clicking insert updates the current timer. And it's a bit strange that the terminology is insert for both create and update. So save might have been a better one. And you have another option for new because you can actually add multiple uh, schedules to the same note. I'm going to give our note a keyword of private. Oh, and obviously priority. I mean, it's absolutely priority A for me to have my lunch on time every day. I wish. Let's save and go back to the main screen. So what's changed? Well, we haven't set an icon yet. We've categorized it as private. We can see the duration from 1300 to 1400. If I go to the today view, which is this icon, we can see there it is at one o'clock. And if we go through our week, it's there every day, which is rather good. Now, let's have a look at what we're doing in July. And you can see eat lunch is now set across every day as you would expect it to be. And just to show off one kind of final feature that I like associate with notes, this note I've opened here has a telephone number and a fax number. So if I stick my cursor around the start of the phone number and I say dial, it'll pick up the phone number. And if you have an auto dialing modem attached, which most of us did back in the day, it would dial it for you. This is where you can start to see how this tool might have been used. You would have an Atari ST on the desktop of your sales team, and they'd use this to schedule their meetings and calls and use the manager to dial it. And of course, that was the very core of ICL's absolutely beautiful one per desk, which was a Sinclair QL with a telephone slammed into it with some dialing software on it. This was a rattle stop tour around the manager and Harlequin in general, but I think you can kind of see the utility of the tool and just how versatile it was. Personally, manager, I'll stick to my phone.